Hi, I'm Guy. I'm a PhD student at Columbia, and this is joint work with Yong Ku Chan and Tobias Sauls on the effect of privacy regulation on the data industry, empirical evidence from GDPR. So in our view, the fundamental, ten fundamental tension at the heart of data privacy regulation is that on the one hand, firms rely on consumer-generated data to uh, successfully deploy machine learning technologies, which are now used in a wide range of settings, and to target advertising, which is used to accrue revenues by most firms online. On the other hand, consumers are increasingly wanting control over the data that firms collect on them. And this has been amplified in recent years due to a number of high profile data breaches, as well as a uh, vast increase in the scale, scope, and opaqueness of the way that consumer data gets collected and, and used. And so what we do in this paper is we study the impact of the introduction of the General Data Protection Regulation, or the GDPR, in Europe in 2018. And the question that we really want to answer in this paper is to understand this tension. And in particular, we want to understand how does GDPR affect the ability for firms to collect and utilize data. So on the one hand, we, we want to understand is how consumers respond to the ability to deny data collection. The particular part of GDPR that we focus on is on the consent portion of legislation which in principle is supposed to allow consumers the ability to opt out of data collection um, from firms that they weren't able to do before. And then the second is to understand the consequences of this for firms, right? To understand how does the change in data that the firms can see uh, affect their ability to predict consumer behavior and accrue advertising revenues. And the setting that we use is a proprietary data that we have from a third party intermediary that spans most of the online travel industry. And it's a sophisticated data relying company whose main business is to predict consumer behavior and to provide targeted advertising. Uh, so first I'll go over the related literature uh, on the topic. So first the empirical literature on privacy regulation. Uh, the earliest paper we know of is this 2009, uh, this paper from Abby Goldfarb and Catherine Tucker in 2011, which looks at the 2009 cookie law and broadly found that this law had a reduction in advertising effectiveness. This law was a weaker, earlier version of the GDPR. Uh, there's been a number of papers concurrent to ours looking at GDPR, who first roughly, you know, th these two papers roughly find similar conclusions to us in the sense of reductions in recorded traffic and increases in the value of opt-in and consumers. Um, this set of papers uh, broadly shows increased market concentration, and, and we think our work has some implications for the tension between privacy regulation and competition, but I'll defer that to the end. The second literature uh, is the more theoretical literature on informational externalities, which has become uh, popular in the theory literature in the past few years. And we think that our results sort of have some, provide some empirical evidence that of such externalities. Okay. So before we go into the empirics, I wanna go through uh, how consumers are tracked on the internet and how we think this is, should be impacted by GDPR and how that sort of gonna frame the results that I discuss later. So at least in 2018, the main way that websites were tracking consumers was through placing cookies on the, in their browsers, right? So cookies are small files that are stored in the browser that allow a firm to track a consumer over time, right? You can think of it as a panel identifier. Uh, and there's broadly two types of cookies. The first are so-called essential cookies, which are things like login cookies and other things which are essential for a firm to be able to provide a good user experience for its consumers. And the second are so-called non-essential cookies, um, which are used for you know uh, tracking consumers across different websites and uh, targeting them for advertising. So GDPR made it so that such cookies, uh, such non-essential cookies had to be um, one, uh, firms had to inform consumers about them, and second, consumers could opt out of, of, of having them set. And absent GDPR, the main ways that consumers would protect their privacy was really through um, messing around with this cookie, right? So consumers could manually delete their cookies. They could go into private browsing mode, which would give them a temporary uh, sandbox of cookies. They could use ad blockers, which at least in our setting would mean that the cookie is going to be continually regenerated every time that the consumer goes to the website or web browser defaults, which would prevent some cookies from being set altogether. Um, so 
the important thing for us is that these previous versions of privacy protection primarily serve as a form of obfuscation, right? Where the consumer's data is going to end up in the firm's database, but by deleting cookies or having ad blockers, this is just going to lead them to have new identifiers, right? So the firm won't be able to link them across time, but it'll be the same consumer's information that's just going to be stored in different identifiers. With GDPR, uh, GDPR opt-out is going to serve as a form of deletion, right? So by opting out, consumer data cannot be sent to the firm, even with an obfuscate identifier. And so this sub substitution between these two can plausibly lead to a, a different data generating process, which is going to impact uh, firm level variables that we care about. And so to illustrate this, consider this very stylized example, right? So there, the rows here are going to be the different identifiers. So we're going to have four real consumers, right? And this left panel here is going to be the full visibility baseline, right? Which is going to be what the firm would see if they're if they could see everything perfectly and there was no cookie obfuscation or GDPR. And one thing to note here is you can see that all four consumer profiles are completely distinct. The second panel is the obfuscation panel, right? So this is the pre-GDPR world, and we're going to suppose that consumer four is going to be able to uh, delete his cookies. So he goes on the website at time period one, deletes his cookies and comes back. And now the firm, instead of seeing this consumer history, is going to see these two separate consumer histories for two time periods. And importantly, note that if the firm wants to use this information to predict, you have that consumer one and consumer four are pulled together and consumer two and consumer five are pulled together in terms of their histories which is going to make the firm's prediction problem hard. Under GDPR, this guy can now, instead of deleting his cookies, is just going to opt out in period one. And so what's going to happen is he's just going to be removed from the data completely. And so what's going to happen is the firm is going to see less data, but that data is going to be a little bit cleaner because it's not going to have this pooling and might actually increase predictive performance. Okay. So now to turn to our empirical strategy. So we use a standard difference in differences design where the treatment group is going to be major EU countries such as the UK, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain. And the control is going to be uh, other countries that aren't subject to GDPR, but should in principle have similar travel patterns. And we confirm this with Google Trends data uh, and we pick the US, Canada, and Russia. And the time period is going to be a short window around GDPR. We're going to aggregate our data to a weekly level. And then we're going to look at two specifications. We're going to look at a sort of standard pre and post um, difference in different specification, as well as a time varying one uh, by based on the week. Okay. So first, what are estimates for opt-out? Right. So in when I show you these graphs, uh, week number 22 is going to be, uh, so we normalize everything to be Friday to Friday weeks. So week 22 is going to uh, start on Friday, May 25th, which is going to be the first day GDPR is, 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 an act, is uh, uh, active. And you see in week 22, a stark drop in the overall number of cookies that the firm see. And it's pretty stable across the time periods that we consider. And this corresponds to roughly a 12.5% reduction. We show in the text that this is Robusta using synthetic controls instead of difference and differences, as well as incorporating travel trends using Google Trends data. Okay. So now we look at the question of how does this impact the trackability of consumers? And so to do this, what we do is we define a persistence metric where every week we collect the set of cookies that we see it and that week. And then we ask what fraction of these are still around one week later, two weeks later, three weeks later, four weeks later. And we uh, run these through our empirical uh, specification. And across these different specifications, we broadly find that there is an increase in consumer persistence right at the onset of GDPR that's going to roughly correspond to an uh, 8% increase in persistence. So next, what we're going to turn to is try to understand why, right? So we observe there's a reduction in the total number of consumers, and we observe that these the guys that remain are more persistent users. So there's two plausible hypotheses for this. The first is a so-called privacy mean substitution hypothesis, where obfuscators are more likely to opt out, right? So if you think of this graph, you know, these guys like consumer four are going to generate artificially short consumer histories. And so if they go away from the data, 
we're going to start to see artificially longer uh, uh, consumer histories. The other hypothesis is the selective consent hypothesis, which is that people that are more frequent users of the website may be more likely to consent to data collection. And so if the infrequent guys are dropping, then mechanically we're going to have that the remaining consumers are more trackable. And so to decompose this, we do a couple of exercises, but the main one we do is we focus in on a website where we know that they implemented GDPR properly. And we look for evidence of so-called single searchers, right? So we know that a, that if people use, for instance, ad blockers, these obfuscators are always going to generate search histories of length one. And so what we do is we construct a count model with two types of consumers, obfuscators and non-obfuscators. Obfuscators are always going to have search histories of length one, and non-obfuscators are going to have uh, natural uh, count, um, natural counts, right? And so evidence of these sort of obfuscators are, is going to be given by an excess number of people with search histories of length one, and then evidence that uh, this reduce over, as a result of GDPR will, will be if this fraction of single searches reduces after GDPR. And so we test whether there is uh, evidence of such single searchers, and we find that the answer is yes, and that we, there's a subsequent decrease post GDPR. And I'll show you graphically, at least for the website that we use, what the change in the distribution looks like on the next slide. The second thing that we do, which I won't detail here, is we also look at heterogeneous treatment effects by browser and operating system and find results roughly consistent with the privacy mean substitution hypothesis. And so for this one website, you can see, so here is going to be the change in probability mass of the number of searchers uh, from post GDPR to pre GDPR. And you can roughly see that the biggest change from pre to post is going to be in these, the guys with, that are single searchers. And for the rest of them, there's going to be not that much change in the probability distribution. Um, so at least when you look at this graphically, you know, it seems pretty apparent, but it also holds up when we do the statistical exercise I talked about in the previous slide. Okay. So now we turn to the question of firm side variables. So the firm prediction problem is to classify individuals as purchasers or not purchasers after every travel query. And so what the firm does is they observe the set of, of um, previous searches and when the consumer types in a search, they produce a classification of whether or not this guy is gonna buy or not on this search. And so what we observe is we observe the output of the probabilistic classifier used by the firm and the ground truth labels that um, of, of whether or not these guys actually ended up buying or not. And what we do is we evaluate the change in prediction error according to the standard area under the curve metric um, using the same empirical strategies before. So the same empirical strategies before works precisely because the firm will train its models on uh, separate website country pairs, which means that any changes as a result of the data on of, of, of GDPR will only impact the EU websites models and not necessarily the US models. Okay, and what we find is actually that per, uh, per, we can't reject the null that predictability is unchanged in the short run. And if anything, we find that there's weak evidence that prediction got better. And we explain this because there are sort of opposing effects from the changes in data that we saw before. On the one hand, increase in trackability is going to increase predictability. On the other hand, loss in data size is going to decrease predictability. And to validate that, you know, one issue with the short run analysis is that for this kind of outcome variable, you might think that the firm's um, classification algorithm won't adjust automatically. And so what we do is we do a back of the envelope exercise where cross-sectionally we look at how much the increase in trackability should impact predictability and how much the loss in data size should impact predictability. And if you put these together in the, in the long run, we similarly will find that prediction should get a little bit better. But if anything, we don't find that it gets worse. Okay. Um, next, we turn to the consequences for advertising revenues. So in this setting, you should be uh, our advertising setting is keyword search advertising, right? So the the firms are not bidding on particular consumer histories, but rather they're bidding uh, for particular keywords. So advertisers are bidding on a consumer who searched for a flight from New York City to LA. Uh, 
Okay. And this means that they're they're sort of bidding on the average consumer that they should see on this on this segment and not necessarily particular histories. And one important caveat for the results that I, I'm about to present is that the way that GDPR is going to impact advertisements is that if a consumer opts out, the intermediary is going to be shut out completely, which means that the reduction in data size and events that we observe is going to mechanically reduce the number of advertisements. And then second, payment here is going to be per click and not per impression. So the clicks is going to be an important variable for us. So first, we observe that the total number of advertisements that are clicked on does in fact go down. And this is consistent, this point estimate is consistent with what we found in terms of the overall drop in data size. And so part of this is, is most likely due to the mechanical reduction in advertisements served because of the guys that opted out of data collection. When we look at revenue, we actually observe a sizable point estimate, um, but it's statistically insignificant. And, and part of the reason why, when we look at the time varying graph, is that there's a sharp reduction originally, which is somewhat offset later by the next thing, which is that we find that the average bid of the firm actually uh, is higher post GDPR relative to pre GDPR, indicating that there is higher value uh, for um, the consumers post GDPR relative to pre GDPR. And we actually see that this is an immediate, but rather a gradual effect that kicks in a few weeks after the GDPR is enacted. And we, we, we for in terms of the mechanisms for this, we argue that um, effectively the finding that we had before, which is that the privacy mean substitution hypothesis is the uh, reason for this increase in trackability actually leads advertisers to have better estimates of, of the conversion rates for their advertisements, which sort of slowly increases their bid over time. And so to summarize, we broadly do find that third-party data access is negatively affected, both in terms of the overall data size and the reduction in revenues. And this, again, speaks to this tension between privacy regulation and competition, which has been found in the literature. If you think that you know the firm that, that we study competes with the likes of Facebook and Google, who might not be as negatively impacted by such consent-based data practices. The second thing that we find is that there's a surprising offset in revenue loss through higher prices, and we attribute this to the externality that comes from the uh, reduction of, of number of obfuscating consumers in the data, which is in line with some of the theory literature, which is positive that such data privacy externalities exist and have a big impact on such markets. And finally, we find the ability to predict consumers' purchase behavior is not significantly impacted by GDPR. Uh, thanks and look forward to your comments and questions.